Hello, everybody. I'm George Williams. Uh, and in case you didn't get it from the introduction, uh, I'm going to talk about data. Uh, so to introduce myself, uh, I'm the next search catalog coordinator at Northeast Kansas Library System in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, which is also known as Nichols. Uh, a lot of people in the Koha community think that Nichols is the shared catalog that we operate here in Northeast Kansas. But Nichols is actually a regional library system uh, that was established in the late 1960s by Kansas law. And we have 117 member libraries in the 14 counties in the upper right hand corner of the map that you see on your screen there. This is the area where Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri all meet uh, with that funny little edge of Kansas uh, that's given that shape by the, by the Missouri River. Um, of the 117 libraries in Nichols, only 52 participate in NextSearch catalog. And out of the 11 employees at Nichols, I'm the only one who has 100% of their time devoted to NextSearch catalog and Koha. We've been using Koha since 2008, and we've been on community Koha supported by and hosted by Biowater Solutions since uh, 2011. I've been in Nichols since 2016. Before that, uh, I had a bunch of different library jobs and just a bunch of other jobs in general. Um, and like I said before, in 2019, I was the Koha US president. I was thinking about it when I was getting ready for this. Uh, and I realized that out of the eight Koha, conf uh, Koha US conferences, this is the seventh one I've been to. Uh, so happy to be here. This is a great organization and I love to support it. Um, these slides are available at hopperdietzel.org. So if you go to that site and then click on the link that says, see my presentations here, the top one is Koha US 2021 Future of Past Data. That'll take you straight to these slides that you're already looking at. Um, so that's hopperdietzel.org. It's uh, spelled just like it sounds. For those of you that don't want to venture out and spell hopperdietzel, you can also go to bit.ly. Uh, I've got a bit link that's bit.ly slash past data 2021. That will also take you straight to the slides if you don't want to learn how to spell hopperdietzel. So like I said before, I'm going to talk today about data or data. Um, I'll probably call it both throughout this uh, presentation. So I'm going to go back uh, and look at those three questions that I mentioned in the introduction. They're kind of going to be the theme of what I talk about today. So um, these are paraphrases, but these are more or less questions that I've had um, since the beginning of this year. So. Uh, one of the questions was, I have a borrower who wants to know the title of every book they've checked out since 2002. Is there a report that I can run to tell me that? Uh, so the second one is, I need to know weekly circulation by item type, collection code, and shelving location 
for the last five years. I can find a report that does part of that, but I have to enter the start and end date for each week. And I can only get data that goes back to 2018. Can you help? And the third one was, I wanna know circulation by zip code since 2011. Can you write a report for that? After talking to them, it turns out they wanted circulation by borrower's zip code, you know, who at this zip code um, checked out things at my library and they wanted to go back 10 years. And I actually had two requests like that that were similar. Um, they wanted some demographic data, who's using the library as they were writing strategic plans. So uh, here are the answers that I've given to these three questions. Uh, number one, no. Number two, no. And number three, no. Um, these are all kind of complex questions. And it's not uncommon for me to get questions like this. I think what's happened uh, as far as people's expectations go is I think that a lot of people have seen too many episodes of CSI or NCIS or Criminal Minds. Um, there's always some point in an episode of Criminal Minds where the BAU is out in the field and Derek has to call Penelope back in Washington, DC. And after some sexually inappropriate small talk, he will make a request uh, like, you know, we need a list of everybody who served time in a county jail in the 1970s. And they've had at least two root canals and they've been recently released from a mental institution and Spencer thinks that the mental institution may have been near a tungsten mine. Um, and they may have lived in Joplin, Montana between 1965 and 1975. Then you see Penelope, you know, she will usually say something like, let me get back to you. And then five minutes later, she'll call back and she'll say, I've got 50 people that meet those criteria, but only two of them lived in Joplin, Montana during that time. Um, I'm texting you their details. Um, I think people have this notion, this expectation that uh, just because some, some data that they're interested in isn't on paper uh, or in a filing cabinet or a book or in the back room of a building in a banker's box, um, they think that this data is kept forever um, and that we can access it instantly, just like that. Um, they think that since the data is stored in the cloud, that there is no burden uh, to keeping that data forever. Uh, they think of the cloud as an unlimited resource. Uh, what they don't realize is that putting data in the cloud um, really means putting data on a hard drive on somebody else's computer. Um, the cloud is these guys' computer, you know, the founders of Google. If you use Google Drive, they own the computer that your data is uh, stored on. Um, these are the founders of Dropbox. And uh, this guy, uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, since we are a Bywater Solutions customer, our data is now on an Amazon Web Services server somewhere. So this guy owns the computers where our Koha uh, now lives. So there are two basic reasons that we don't keep data forever. Um, there's a practical reason and, and there's a philosophical reason. Um, the practical reason is that it takes up physical space uh, on our server. Uh, the philosophical reason, you know, is that the longer that we keep data and the more data that we keep, uh, the greater the risk is to the patron um, that their confidentiality is gonna be breached. As far as the practical goes, you know, our Koha, like I said before, is uh, supported and maintained by Biowater Solutions. And I'm sure that if we wanted to save more data, I could call and talk to Nate or Brendan and say, can you increase our server space so that we can save more data? And I'm, I'm sure what had happened is that they would say, yeah, that'd be, we can do that. Let me get you a price and we can uh, add that into your contract. Um, the more data we keep, uh, the bigger the server we're going to need and um, the bigger server is going to have a greater cost. 
Um, just looking at our next statistics um, from the last few years, you know, currently we have over 400,000 bibliographic records. We have over a million item records, over 115,000 borrower records. And up until, uh, up until the pandemic started, we were checking out about 100,000 items a month on average. Um, if we had been um, keeping all of that kind of data all the way back to 2008 when we started using Koha, our storage needs uh, would be significant. Um, as far as the philosophical reasons go, um, Potential breaches of uh, confidentiality are always a risk. Uh, and I know that in the upcoming versions of Koha, we are currently on 2005 and beginning in 2011, um, there are some encryption processes that we can turn on to anonymize some of the uh, patron statistical data and make things a little more secure for the data that we do keep. Um, but you know, by Kansas law, and I know that the laws are similar in most states, um, public libraries are public institutions and um, there are open record laws that affect us. But uh, the Kansas open record laws um, have exceptions for uh, certain library records that are considered confidential, you know, like a borrower registration, uh, circulation or, or loan records. Uh, and payment records that are that relate to identifiable individuals. If there's something in the record that can point to a specific person, those records are considered confidential. And then there's the usual things like, you know, if somebody donates stuff to the library, materials to the library, and they want to be anonymous, um, that information is considered confidential. Personnel records are, are normally confidential. Um, but Kansas law specifically also includes correspondence between the library uh, and a private individual, um, whether it's print uh, correspondence or uh, email or text or, you know, uh, whatever messaging you use in your library. Um, for us in uh, Northeast Kansas, um, confidentiality and the private nature of borrow records has been an issue. Um, well, first off, because in the last six years, we've had two libraries um, that are Nichols members. They're not part of our Koha shared catalog. They're using different ILSs. But we've had two libraries um, that have been the subject of ransomware attacks. Uh, one of those libraries paid the ransomware. Uh, the other one did not. Uh, we've also had issues in Kansas where law enforcement has asked us for um, patron records. Um, in the 19 years that I worked in libraries before I moved to Kansas, there was one time in my career where somebody, uh, a law enforcement asked me for patron records. And when I said, you know, those are considered confidential under Idaho law, and I can't give them to you without a warrant. And they, the police were fine with that. Um, here in Kansas, in the last six years, I've had at least five requests from law enforcement asking for confidential data from our system. Um, and the most effective way of keeping borrower information confidential is to delete it when you don't need it anymore. Um, that's, you know, anonymizing records and hashing out the, the uh, uh, borrower numbers and the card numbers and the data um, is a good step, but, you know, an even easier step is just, if you don't need the data anymore, just delete it. Um, in the case of these five, uh, five or six instances where law enforcement has contacted us, on, I think, at least three of those occasions, uh, I was told that I should preserve any data that we had because they were going to get a subpoena. And when they gave me card numbers, usually in all these cases that where I've been asked to preserve data, it's because they gave me a card number and they wanted to know information about the person that held that card. 
Um, and in two of those cases, the card had been used in such a long time that the data had been deleted. Um, and in another one of those cases, there was uh, information about the person, but then they um, never, they had, hadn't checked anything out in so long, there was no history on their card uh, of what their uh, borrowing had been. Uh, and in the one case where I, they actually did subpoena me and asked me to come to court with information the night before the, the court appearance, uh, they settled out of court. Uh, they took a plea agreement. So, so the most surefire way of keeping borrower data confidential is to delete the data you don't need. So let's um, uh, you know, talk about what to save and what not to save. And that's what the question really becomes. Koha can save a ton of data. You can save as much data as you want, uh, but it's good to limit what you save in Koha and what you don't because of the physical space and patron confidentiality. Uh, and even if you do save everything, um, there are limits on what you can do with old data. And so it's uh, a good idea to come up with a strategy for what to save um, what not to save, and then how to collect it and when to collect it. And it's a good idea to come up with a regular schedule for collecting data because you want to save data um, when it's uh, fresh. You want to collect the data when the data is fresh. Uh, expired data is, uh, when data gets old, it's going to get uh, less fresh and it's less useful. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes with some examples from some SQL queries. Um, so this is our retention schedule for the tables, uh, for the statistics table. And uh, all the old issues, reserves, messages, bibliotheques, items, and action logs. And let me talk uh, specifically about some of these. Um, for most data, we keep 13 months. Uh, biblio information, item information, old issues and old reserves, we keep them for 13 months. And that gives us more or less one year's worth of data. The big exception has been action logs. Um, until recently, we were only keeping action log data for the previous 60 days. And that has to do with um, the way that the cataloging log used to work. Up until I think Koha 1811 or maybe 1905, I'm not sure how long ago it's been, but it used to be if you had the cataloging log turned on, every time you checked out an item and every time you checked in an item, if you were using the cataloging log, uh, each check in and check out, um, updates the mark record for uh, date last seen, date last borrowed, number of borrows, number of renews, all of that information gets updated. And it used to be the cataloging log entered each of those actions as a separate line in the cataloging log. So we wanted to leave the cataloging log on because it gave us a lot of good information we could use in tracking down problems. But the problem was, is that it was generating, you know, we we're checking out 100,000 uh, items a month. That means we were generating about 800,000 lines worth of data in the action logs, just from the cataloging log every month. So we cut that down to 60 days so that we could retain that data. Now that the cataloging log, um, uh, the action logs don't record some of that uh, cataloging data the way they used to, um, we felt like it was time to up that to 120 days so that we can save more data. So when we actually, I'm gonna run a report in a few minutes that'll actually show us how old some of our data is. Um, the cataloging log, we're still in that period where um, we were at 60 days, but we haven't gotten 120 days out um, from the change yet. So. So it's a weird number right now. Uh, the two other exceptions are message queue and statistics. The message queue, the sent messages, 
on the patron's notices tab. We only keep those for the last six months. And I'm thinking of upping that to 13 months too. I haven't really uh, made a final decision on that. And uh, I'm in no hurry to do it. It's not like a critical issue. Um, as far as statistics goes though, we keep the data for uh, 25 months. So uh, I've talked about how long we keep uh, uh, some of this data in next search catalog. And now let me talk about the statistics table specifically um, because it has some benefits and pitfalls. So every time you um, do that, you check something in, check something out, renew an item, or if a fee is paid or if a fee is written off, um, all of that data is written into the statistics table. And the date time field um, is created when you do one of those actions. The statistics branch records the location where the item, where the transaction is taking place. Value, I'm not sure what the value um, field does, but type is whether it's issue, renew, write off, payment. Um, other is another one that I'm not sure what it does. But then we've got item number, item type, location, borrower number, and collection code. So um, item number and borrower number are pretty straightforward, but statistics item type will take the item type of the item at the time that it's being checked out. And statistics location is, uh, is items.location at the time that the item is being checked out. And statistics C code, collection code, is whatever is in items.c code when the item is being checked out. Um, so the advantage of this is that if you have situations where maybe you're using uh, an item type like new book or a location like new bookshelf or a collection code that's like new video or whatever, um, those are being recorded in the statistics table and they're being recorded at the time that the item was checked out. So if the item type changes from new book to book, the statistics table, the item type for that transaction will always be new book as long as it's in the statistics table. Um, it's not affected by changes to the item record uh, in the items table. Um, and a couple of things that I want to point out too and be very clear about our statistics branch, that's the branch um, for item and issues, renews, and, and uh, check-ins, returns. That's the um, branch library where the transaction is happening. So if my library in uh, Seneca sends an item to Payola, um, when that item gets checked out at Payola, statistics branch is going to record Payola as statistics branch. Um, and statistics location is the item's current shelving location. That's uh, in the item record, that's items location, not items uh, dot permanent location. So if you're using the cart feature where, um, and that's a feature in Koha where you check an item in, and it is temporarily assigned a location with the code of cart. Um, and we use cart and we call it in the catalog, it, it appears as recently returned. And so this helps people using the catalog know that the item was recently returned. So it may not be on the shelf where it's supposed to be because it may be on a cart somewhere on its way back to the shelf. Well, statistics location records the current shelving location, not the permanent location. So if you are using cart and a borrower checks out an item that has a, a temporary location of cart, that's the location that's gonna be recorded in the statistics table. So let me look now, um, let me show you a very basic, um, uh, some very basic SQL. All of this data is coming from statistics. And it's just a count of lines and statistics um, by group by branch where the statistics type is issue or renew. So that's checkout or renewal. So all this report is doing is counting the total number of checkouts and renewals in the statistics table. And if we look for Atchison here, 
we'll notice we've got uh, 133,089 um, lines for issues in, in the Neckles uh, system right now. So if I add item type to this report and I'm getting item type from statistics, um, then that's gonna be the item type that the item had when it was checked out. And it's gonna be a really similar report to this one. Uh, it's just that you know now I've got Atchison audiobook. There are 36, 3,699 of those 133,000 transactions were audiobooks. Uh, 80,000 were books. Uh, 21,000 were videos and so on. So those are gonna be pretty reliable numbers because all of the data is coming from the statistics table. If, however, we're in a big system like this and we wanna know um, what's the home branch of the items that were checked out at Atchison, um, that's a different report. And um, I've got results here. So audiobook, now we're down to uh, 2,653 uh, from that 3,699 um, because we've got uh, audiobooks that were owned by Atchison. We've got some that were owned by Baldwin City. We've got some that were owned by Burn. We've got some from Bonner Springs. So this just breaks this all down. Here's the thing though, is if I look at this first report, we've got a total of 133,089 results. Um, this is that same uh, report with the uh, item home library, and I've got it set to sum up. Uh, I'm using the roll up function. So over here in this first report, I've got 133,000 items. Uh, lines in that table. And over here, I've only got 127,953. There's a difference there because um, there are items that this report is looking for. We're getting data from statistics and we're getting data from items. And we're doing that where items item number equals statistics item number. So if the item record has been deleted from the items table, there's no longer a way to count that um, because we can't pull the item home library out of an item record that no longer exists. So this is the pitfall with the statistics table is that there are any time we need to look outside of the statistics table, to link item records or borrower records back to the statistics table, um, we have to do it in a way where we get fresh data. So this is um, the same report as before. Um, and if, but what I've got here is I'm putting a date limit on it. I'm saying statistics where the date time is between uh, September 1st and October 1st of 2021, so this month. And if I run this report on October 1st to get September data, that data is going to be fresh. Uh, and if I actually run that, you know, here we've got Atchison audiobook, 38 audiobooks so far. That number is going to be pretty reliable because it's, if I run this on October 1st, and I'm looking just at September 20, 2021 data. Um, in, the, in the month of September, the number of items that have had their item record change in September or be deleted in September is going to be a lot lower than if I run the same report on October 1st, looking for data from September of 2019. If I do that, which should be this report, yes. Um, then, you know, who knows how many uh, audiobook item records may have changed in those intervening two years. Um, so, by linking out from statistics to other tables, um, you've got to be careful in how you do that um, if you're going to look at old data, because, um, you know, in order to really get a good uh, in order to really get good data from here, you would also want to join this to deleted items. 
Um, in my system, though, deleted item records, those are only those only go back um, 13 months. So even there, there's a potential um, that we're not going to get good results um, because this data isn't fresh. And the same is true with uh, borrower numbers. So out of all of the things, you know, in the statistics table, we've got item number, item type, location, and collection code all come from the item record. Um, and item type, location, and collection code are recorded into the statistics table at the time that the item checks out. But the only information in the statistics table for borrower is borrower number. So if I um, do a report like this, where I'm getting the zip code from the borrower table, this is again a situation where if I run this report for September 21 on October 1st, uh, which is this report here, um, I'm probably gonna get good results and accurate results because the data is gonna be fresh. But if I run um, a report for September 2019 um, on data from the statistics table, linking out to borrower zip code, um, this is another situation where um, there is a potential that um, borrowers could no longer be, um, their, their borrower record could have been changed, updated, or deleted, and I'm not going to get a good result. You know, here are some statistics for our deletions um, just in the, since 2019. You know, we've already deleted 15,000 borrowers um, this year. That's because um, we do that on a regularly um, scheduled process uh, that I run manually, um, uh, trying to do it almost monthly. Uh, but we've, so far this year, we've deleted 65,000 item records. So those are item records that I can no longer link to from statistics. I could link to deleted items for the until 13 months have passed, but after that, um, I'm not gonna get good reliable data. And in 2020, we deleted a lot fewer borrowers in 2020, um, only 3,900, um, but we did delete 186,000 items in uh, 2020. And we deleted 253,000 items in 2019. And we deleted um, 12,000 borrowers in 2019. So uh, that's data that we can no longer um, link back to in the statistics table without doing some more complex uh, query writing. So the questions I've gotten so far this year, I'm gonna go back to these yet again. So the first one, the question was, uh, borrower wants to know all everything they've checked out. Is there a report? Um, and the answer to that was no, uh, because we only keep the old issues data for the past 13 months. And the second issue with this one is that we've only been using COHA since 2008. Uh, and an even further issue is that that library didn't join uh, Next Search Catalog until 2011. So if there are any records from before 2011, uh, that's a library that wasn't automated before they joined. So they might have some pre-2011 uh, data like written down in their library, but we don't have it at Koha. And what I told them is that no, we don't keep that data because uh, we only keep it for 13 months, and that's for the patron's confidentiality. Uh, the second question was uh, CERC by item type collection code and children location for the last five years, weekly. Um, my answer to that question was no, I'm not gonna do it weekly, um, but we have been keeping that data for the last couple of years for collection code. And for the last year, as item type, um, we've been storing that offline because it is something that libraries were continually asking for. They have always had the ability to run reports monthly uh, at their will. 
um, and then save the data and do whatever they want with it. The issue that always comes up is they don't think of doing this until after they discover that they have a need for the data. So rather than disappointing people and just saying, no, we don't keep that data, it's happened often enough that I just save it for everybody so that um, when people ask me, uh, where's the report for that? I can just say, hey, there's a spreadsheet for it. Uh, the next question was CERC by zip code. Um, checkouts by borrower based on the borrower's zip code. Can you write a report for that? Um, and they wanted 10 years worth of data. This is for their strategic planning process uh, at one library. And I think it's probably, that's probably why the other library that asked me about it asked me about it, um, is they want to know who's using the library. Where are these people coming from? Um, and nobody had ever asked for that statistic before. And I got asked about it twice within a couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, I had to say to these people that I, 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 it's not going to be good data if I look back more than a couple of months. But I started keeping this data system wide in July. Um, since they're interested and other libraries interested, it seems like it wasn't a bad one to incorporate, but I've only, you know, got a few months worth of data right now. So what this all boils down to is, like I said, it's a good idea to come up for, with a strategy for what you want to report on. Um, and so how to decide what to report on. You know, um, most libraries, there's a board that's going to have a meeting sometime in the month. So what kind of data do they want? What kind of data are they going to want consistently over time? Um, it's also, um, you're also almost certainly going to have a year end report for the state library, because that state library data that you think is just going to the state library, if you're a public library in the United States, isn't just going to the state library, it's going to the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, uh, Library Services uh, in Washington, DC. The data that the state collects, um, they collect because the IMLS wants it. Um, and it's a good practice to be in. Um, and then you've got to ask questions like, what kind of collection development data would be useful to collect regularly um, for the people making decisions about what to buy. You know, if you find that uh, right now, the trend that I'm seeing in circulation is that music CDs just do not circulate. So if you can look at a report regularly and you can track um, CD usage, music CD usage over a long period of time and see that it is steadily declining, and that those things are soon going to be um, the VHS of the future, um, that's good data to collect. That's probably really useful to collect. And then the zip code data is demographic data. You know, what kind of decision making uh, process do you go through for your strategic plan? And what kind of data do you need to make that plan, uh, to, to base that plan on evidence based data? And then for us in a consortium where we're shipping things back and forth all the time, you know, what kind of data do we need for planning for the future of how things are shared between libraries? And then you've got to ask, you know, when to collect those data and where to store it. Um, for us, monthly works well because, you know, I have a report that I need to give to our Northeast Kansas Library System trustees every month. And so, I schedule to run these reports on the first of each month and I write the reports in such a way that when they run, they're looking at data from the previous month in the calendar. So on October 1st, between midnight and uh, 1.30 a.m., I use the scheduler in the reports module in Koha to um, schedule the reports that I wanna run to run in the middle of the night. So when I get to work on the first work day of each month in my email, there's just all these reports that I have to uh, pretty up and um, present to our members. 
And currently we store the data in Google Drive, but we're going to be switching to GitHub in January. Um, it's just going to be a lot easier for me to uh, share the data once it's in GitHub. And then I, again, I'll be able to track changes to the data, which is something that I can't do in Google Drive. So the main set of reports I use, once again, um, these are all links. So if you go to hopperdietzel.org and find the, the presentation, um, I'm gonna click on one of these reports and show you where it's gonna take you. Uh, I you have a process where I back up all of the reports for Next Search Catalog onto GitHub once a month. And here is the SQL for one of the reports that I run each month to collect circulation data. In our system, this is report number 3418. And I just use the scheduler to schedule it to run at like 12.05 AM on the first of the month. And then I send it to my inbox. And when I get to work on the next morning, uh, it's already there. But uh, we used to run my predecessor used to run six or seven different reports uh, every month and then share links to those reports, save them as Google Sheets, and then she would share links to them. Um, and so at the end of the year, there would be uh, six or seven reports per month times 12 months a year. That would be how many Google Sheets were produced. Um, I've got this set up so that this, can, this data can be plugged into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and instead of, this is actually running one, two, three, four, five, six, seven reports because I've got them all set up as subqueries. This first line of the report says, give me a branch code. And then the second line says, get me the account of items owned at each branch on the first day of the month from this subquery. And then that gets repeated again and again and again. So I've got a subquery that gets the items on the first day of the month, the number of items on the last day of the month, how many items were added, how many items were deleted, how many holdings did each library have in the first of the month, how many holdings were added, how many holdings were deleted. So I've kind of got these broken up into um, my main set of reports. These are the ones that we've been doing for a significant amount of time. Um, if you're looking at the slides, you'll notice that there's, there's always been a left arrow and a right arrow. If you click on the down arrow, that'll get us reports um, by circulation for different categories, circulation by uh, location and item type, uh, location and collection code, borrower zip code, hourly circulation statistics, um, my next batch is for counting um, items and uh, requests. The next batch is for um, local item checkout. Um, net borrows is in the consortium. What's your library's ratio of how many things you borrow to how many things you lend? And then borrower count by category and borrower count by zip code. Uh, and you can click on any of these. And like I said, it'll take you to GitHub. Uh, I just clicked on borrower count by, nope, oh, maybe that one isn't linked right. I'll try and fix that as soon as I can. Um, here we've got another one that doesn't work. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, I'll fix these broken links as soon as I can here. And what does all this look like? How do I distribute them to our number libraries? That's the next question. Um, if I pop that. Okay, so if I actually pop over to, uh, we had a little technical problem there. If I pop over to Koha, uh, our uh, staff client, um, at the 2017 conference, I showed everybody how to add tabs to the internet main uh, HTML section. And that's how I get this data out to our member libraries. Um, I have a tab here that says Statistics 2021 and all of the spreadsheet data, um, all of the spreadsheets are linked here, um, oftentimes with notes. We've added a whole bunch of new collection codes this year. Um, so that's, I've got a whole bunch of notes here about which uh, 
which ones were added on March 1st, which ones were discontinued on June 1st, and which ones were added June 1st, July 8th. So there's been a lot of um, changes to collection codes. Um, but if we go back to the slideshow and we go down to the down arrow here, um, there's nothing propri proprietary or confidential in any of those spreadsheets. So you're welcome if you want to uh, download them and look at them. Um, if you click on any of these links, um, you should just get a, a download window. Oh, there it is. I don't know if you can see that in the, in the screen share, uh, but you will see a download window that'll just, it'll just ask you to open up uh, or save the Excel file to your computer. And I've got these broken down into like our main statistics package, which I divide up into one for this calendar year and ones for the fiscal year. Um, and then I've got detailed statistics, um, cataloging, borrower holdings and item statistics, and then resource sharing statistics. And there's another report here that you can use that is one of the craziest reports um, I've ever written. Again, if you click on the link, uh, you should be able to go to GitHub. And this link does work. Um, I tested it when I had my technical malfunction to make sure it worked correctly before we got to this point. Um, this report is uh, big. Um, it's actually one of the longest reports I've ever written. 2,362 lines long, but it runs in about 30 to 40 seconds. Um, uh, and creating it wasn't as hard as you'd think, but um, it's a date time report. So what it does is it's gonna, um, uh, and I've got it open in a window over here. If I can find it, it's on this tab. What we've got here is a table name and for some of these, I include a subfield uh, and a type. But what's the oldest, um, oldest date in the account offsets table for the created on subfield? What's the oldest date and what's the newest date? So if you run this report, um, it's a big report, but it doesn't take that long to run. It's going to give you essentially every date field and every timestamp field in Koha and it'll give you the uh, largest and smallest values. Um, so I've got here are my action logs. It might be hard to see this um, on the screen at the actual conference, but you can see in our action logs, I don't have any data um, older than uh, July 9th. And that's because like I said, I'm still in that transitional phase where we just upped it from 60 to 120 days. Um, biblios, you'll see that um, I don't have any uh, old deleted biblio or deleted biblio metadata um, that's older than, um, that has a timestamp older than uh, 2020 August. And in statistics and uh, issues, the statistics data, like I said, goes back to 2019 August. And the old issues and old reserves um, don't go back any further um, than uh, August of 2020. So um, uh, thanks for listening. I hope this was useful to some of you. Um, and again, the slides are available at hopperdiesel.org. Um, the credits, uh, all the images that um, ask for attribution, um, I put the attribution in the highlighted and in the photo. The Star Wars intro I created using the Star Wars crawl at playstarwars.com. And the intro music, I didn't want to get, uh, I didn't want to use the copywritten Star Wars music. Um, so I found some free music called Battle Ready by Brian Teo on freepd.com. It's a great site for finding. Uh, free public domain music that you can download and use for whatever you want. And again, here's my contact information uh, and the bit.ly link that'll get you to that, uh, to that slideshow. So thanks for coming. 
I know that this presentation is pre-recorded. That was because of an unexpected time conflict. Um, now that the presentation's over, I am available. I'm back at my desk and I'm available to answer questions. So I'm going to stop the recording and come back live and uh, I'll be able to answer any questions you guys might have. Thanks a lot.